Hey everyone, today should be a pretty fun video because we are going to be talking about the always famous and legendary U.S. Rifle Caliber 30 M1, or for those of you less cultured people, the M1 Garand or Garand, however you want to call it. I'm going to be calling it Garand for this video. Um, if you don't know what this thing is, you're probably living under a rock. If you've played any video games, watched any movies, or are at all a fan of history, this is something that will strike a chord with you, um, just as it did for me. Um, this is my personal rifle, obviously, hence why I'm doing a video on it. Um, I was able to pick this up through my friend Dan, who you've actually seen on this channel, and is currently supporting the channel via Patreon and I actually had a chance to visit him recently. Um, he was gracious enough to sell me this rifle, and I have to say that this thing has been an absolute delight. Um, I'll, I'll just start off by saying that I have had the opportunity to shoot a lot of really cool rifles, and I've had an opportunity to shoot a lot of very um, glamorized rifles and handguns, etc., etc. And I have to say that the M1 Garand is one of the few rifles that I feel like lives up to its hype. Now, um, obviously here in the United States as an American, we kind of have this infatuation with this rifle as the rifle that f took us through most specific, like mostly World War II, as well as Korea, although that one didn't end as cleanly as World War II did. Um, and because of that, it's always just been a part of our culture and Everyone always talks about how great of a rifle it is, and I wanted to see for myself just, you know, does it hold up to what people have said? And I have to say that, yes, it absolutely does. Now, we have to look at this thing in its context if we're talking about it compared to modern day stuff. There's a pretty big gap. However, considering what this was at the time and what it was contemporary with, this thing really, really set a bar that took a long time to be beat as far as usability, serviceability, accuracy, firepower, ease of handling, and uh, just numbers produced and issued. Um, this thing has really earned its place in history. It's gone, Captain. All What's done. That? It fell off. Oh. So just to be clear, if you haven't already gathered, um, this is not going to be a historical look at the M1 Garand. There are plenty of videos just like that out there. This is going to be more my um, opinions on it, uh, what it is, and then how it compares to what we have available to us nowadays, i.e. what is its place in today's world. So. Starting out, what is this? So this, you know, as I said at the beginning of the video, is the U.S. rifle caliber 30 M1. Caliber 30 referring to the fact that this is a 30-06 rifle. Wasn't originally that, um, and also did stay that. There were some 308 versions of this, of this produced, as well as some, you know, home, home gunsmiths doing some wildcat stuff with these. But um, the, in its traditional guise, this is a 30-06 rifle fed with an end block clip of eight rounds. Um, so the clip as a whole gets inserted into the internal magazine and uh, can potentially cause the dreaded M1 thumb. M1, uh, or excuse me, Garand thumb has an excellent video from way back in the day showing how to avoid Garand thumb. Um, so I'll if you are curious, we'll go to that. However, I, I have to say that due to all of the hype built up around Grand Thumb specifically, um, not the person, the actual activity of loading this, um, 
It's not something I ever had to deal with. I was already aware of it going into shooting M1 Garands, and uh, since then has not been an issue that has presented itself. Although, you know, there's still a lot of time in the future for that to change. Now, one of the big things about this rifle that made it so important at the time is that those eight rounds of 30-06 come out of this thing as fast as you can pull the trigger. Uh, this was really the first widely issued semi-automatic rifle, or at least standard service rifle in semi-automatic uh, in the world. Um, we all know that the Russians fielded a lot of semi-automatics during World War II. The Germans fielded some semi-automatics during World War II. There were some other ones floating around the world at the time, but really nothing that was the standard service rifle like the M1 Garand was. So to go over kind of what is all involved in this rifle, in case you haven't had the opportunity to shoot one of these yourself, we're gonna go, be going from front to back, kind of going over its features. So right off the gate, we have a, a lack of any muzzle device or muzzle brake or anything like that compared to say the, um, the Soviet offerings with the SVT-38s and SVT-40s. Um, they had a muzzle brake. The M1 Garand did not include one of those. However, I don't think that it's necessarily detrimental to what this thing is. We have our gas plug here at the front and um, the gassing of this rifle is one of the, I guess, modern day hindrances to it. Um, at the time it wasn't a problem because all the ammo being run through these was military manufactured and issued. So it was all designed to the same correct spec. However, with modern, more efficient powders, you do run the risk of overpressurizing these and bending your op rod. Um, that is not something we all want to happen. There are companies that make aftermarket plugs for these so that you can either adjust it yourself to fine tune it or ones that are gonna be self-regulating. InRange TV has a really good video on those options. So if you're interested in that kind of stuff, definitely check out their video. We have a hooded, well, not a hooded, but a shielded front sight up here. Um, I have personally not run into an issue with, so for those of you who haven't shot a lot of shielded front sights, there are times when it's easy to mistake if you're looking through your rear peep sight or especially a notch sight to mistake one of the other shields on either side of the front post as your front sight when shooting under you know time stress or actual stress. Um, I have not found that to be an issue with this one. And in fact, I think that this sight picture is a truly excellent sight picture um, with that really nice little peep at the rear with that not or with that nice squared off front post. It helps really aid in my ability to shoot this thing accurately out to even reasonable distances. Moving back here, we have our bayonet lug and I just so happen to have a really, really nice condition bayonet to match this thing. It just slides on to that bayonet lug, has the little ring that captures over the, um, uh, over the end of the muzzle there. If I were to go ahead and take off this scabbard here, we have this nice long edge here, which 
if we are talking about the uh, battlefields of World War II, if I'm going to have a long sharp stick at the end of this thing, um, this is a pretty nice sharp stick to have. And it is also serviceable for a lot of other things, i.e. other real world stuff they might be doing on the World War II battlefield, like uh, food prep or any other little things that I might need my bayonet for. However, again, serves really well as a nice, sharp, pointy stick. Now, moving back, we do have a stacking swivel here. Um, I, I see a lot of people, uh, or talk to a lot of people that think, don't, either A, don't know what this is, or B, think that it's just a forward sling mount, um, but this is a stacking swivel, so if I have multiple rifles in the field, I can stack them against each other using this little latch here to have them support each other instead of letting them just sit on the ground, because, uh, these things are pretty susceptible to things like dirt and mud, so we don't want this laying in the mud if we can avoid it, so stacking swivels are nice for that. We do have a lot of wood on this thing, and I know that some boomer out there is just already drooling over the amount of steel and wood on this rifle, and um, it is definitely nice because you get a lot of protection from the heat wherever I want to place my hand. The um, drawback is it does add a lot of weight. However, the nice part about that weight is it does help really tame down that recoil of 30-06, which we'll talk about later. Uh, moving back, we do have our front sling loop here. Again, more handguard stuff going on with the wood. And then we have our op rod and charging handle. So if you're familiar with the M1A, um, the M1 carbine, the Ruger uh, Mini 14s and Mini 30s. A lot of guns share this very similar method of operation while the internals might be different and how the actual movement is begun might be different on the rifles. The feel and ergonomics of that action is gonna be very similar. And um, there's just a lot of familiarity, I think, again, for any of us who have played video games or watched movies about what is going on here and the legendary ping that comes out when you have your last round fired which I might try to replicate that here in a second. Um, but we have this really large charging handle on the side. It makes it very easy to get a positive grip over that action so that we can rack that thing back. Um, this is reciprocating. However, I can say that having had my hands touching that op rod, um, I have not had it be an issue where I was able to actually stop it from functioning. You just kind of feel it move. Your hand knows that that's not a good place to be, and then you can just move it out of the way. As far as the rest of the receiver here, we have this nice large opening, which makes it very easy to insert those end block clips. Uh, and the, the traditional way is to have your hand bracing against the charging handle as you push those in to prevent it from closing on your hand. And then a lot of times you just need to give it a little bit of a smack to get it to actually close. We do have a way of releasing the clip prematurely if we did we need to just unload this for whatever reason. Um, once you have the action open, typically you'll have to hold that open. You'll use your thumb to push in on this little lever. That'll pop the clip and any remaining rounds out um, if you needed to again unload the rifle. Once the clip is out, the bolt will stay open because that um, magazine follower is now blocking its way forward through some mechanisms internal to the magazine. Now, I guess this is as good a time as any to talk about the very famous Garand ping. So let me grab an empty clip. Ah! 
Dang it. Maybe I shouldn't have messed with that back sight. <laughs> you're hitting low when, you, when you're missing. Okay. Yeah, you're right. Now it just so happens that I have to happen to have an empty clip sitting at my feet in my office pretty much at any given time. So uh, it worked out perfectly for this demonstration. So we have an empty clip now loaded in. So as soon as I pull that charging handle back, uh, we'll get that alert that we are unloaded and get a nice auditory feedback piece uh, as well. Now that, again, there's a lot of lore uh, going into that ping sound and the detrimental effect it had on the longevity of our soldiers fighting overseas. However, if you've actually watched any of the footage that um, Bloke on the Range has done, uh, he's got several videos on the topic that include a lot of primary sources, which is the most valuable sources to use in this situation, not just, well, my dad told me that his buddy told him that his grandpa told him that this was an issue. Uh, a lot of people think, well, now the enemy knows I'm empty, they're going to pop up and shoot. Really, if you spend any time thinking critically about that doesn't make any sense because first of all, I just fired eight rounds of 30 out six. So people's hearings might already be a little compromised, not to mention I'm working not by myself, but in a team of other people who are all firing in the same direction. And the likelihood of them even being able to hear that ping is very low. However, one thing that again, Bloke on the Range was able to demonstrate is that the actual surveyed uh, troops responded that they preferred that ping because it was a good indicator to them that it was time to reload. Again, referencing Bloke on the range, when Lindy Beige came and shot with him, he actually just organically volunteered that while he was doing his Mad Minute. So again, I think a, a little fascinating tidbit of information. Now, speaking of noises and going back to that survey that Bloke on the Range references, we do have our safety here in front of the trigger guard. Again, very similar to the M1A or Mini 14's uh, family of rifles. And that noise was actually more complained about by the troops, at least in Korea, which makes sense. Um, and again, the point they bring up is if I'm laying in ambush waiting for an enemy patrol to go by and you just hear a line of trees go click, oh, granted it would be the other direction, click, um, that I might hear because nothing's going on at the time, whereas the ping, again, at that point that I'm hearing that, some stuff has gone down and my hearing might be compromised. So, um, and also the reality is in, in modern ergonomics, we are not huge fans of putting our finger in the trigger guard to do anything other than pull the trigger. Now, the benefit is I'm pushing away from the trigger, but regardless, I'm still putting my finger in that trigger guard to activate that safety and I'm having to pull rearward. And if I get that movement wrong, again, I'm kicking out a round that I am not intending to, hence causing a negligent discharge. I haven't found it to be a huge issue, but I also haven't been fighting wars with this rifle. If I were actually using it against um, the Jerry's over in Europe, I might have something different to say. Um, but again, not my favorite, but it's also not gonna be a killer for me with the way I'm using this rifle. Hello? Way. You hit the dirt. Should I keep going? Yep. You got four more rounds. Right 
favoring left. That was high. All right, that's it. Now, moving back to the trigger, the trigger is actually pretty decent. Um, you know, it, it's by no means a, a modern trigger, but um, if I had to put a number on it, this one, which, you know, this thing's over 70 years old at this point, it's probably about a five or a six pound trigger, a little bit of movement, but still a fairly crisp trigger. I can say in practice, I've been able to squeeze out consistently with just standard full metal jacket, grand spec ammo, um, about four MOA, which is pretty standard for what these rifles are capable of just in general, even at the time when they were hot off the presses, um, but a, a perfectly serviceable trigger, one I have no complaints about whatsoever. Now, the rear sight here is where a lot of the magic happens for me, at least as far as the act of shooting. We have a really long sight radius, um, and it's something that really the US military stuck to ever since the 19, uh, model 1970, uh, 17 um, Eddie Stones with that nice long sight radius with a peep rear aperture. Pretty much every US rifle after that featured those peep sights, and it really, really makes it easy to be very precise with this gun. I also have very, very positive adjustments for both elevation and windage. And theoretically, as long as this thing is zeroed properly, I can just dial for distance, similar to some of the more modern, um, like Knight's Armament AR uh, rear sights. And it just, again, makes it very easy to do whatever it is I need to do with this rifle. So um, really, really like this rear sight. And again, it has been followed in to a lot of the more, um, the later models of gun based off of this design. Then as far as the stock goes, fairly standard sporting style stock here. We do have a little storage compartment in the stock for a cleaning kit. Um, so pretty straightforward. And then again, our rear sling loop back here. So all in all, a fairly standard feature wise of a military service rifle. However, when you take into account what this thing was going up against, K98s, um, number four end fields, uh, 9130s over in Russia, um, or Arasaka's in Japan, the, the added firepower of that eight rounds of, uh, 30 out six, as fast as you could, you could pull the trigger with a pretty straightforward and easy reload. Um, this thing was really leaps and bounds ahead of everything else on the field. Now, I do have some friends who th think that there are some better semi-automatic rifles of the era. Um, for example, the 1941 Johnson, which I have actually had an opportunity to, to shoot head-to-head -head with a Garand. And while the 1941 Johnson is a nice rifle, um, there are some kind of fatal flaws to it that I think hurt its chances in comparison to some of the other guns. Um, it's a kind of fiddly reload pushing in the side. Um, there's some other issues with the actual operation system with uh, was it the short recoil operating system so a little some finicky stuff there um, also I know people who think that the SVT 40 is a better rifle however every single one of those people is always complaining about magazine availability and compatibility from one gun to another literally I can take any one of these eight round end block clips and shove it in this gun very quickly and easily. I'm not having to worry about stripper clip feeding rimmed cartridges, which is always an issue. Uh, and uh, compared to the um, Gewehr 41 or Gewehr 43, far more reliable system, a far more robust system. And again, I get eight rounds every time I shove my hand in there versus five rounds, although the Mauser stripper clips are far superior to the Russian rimmed stripper clips. And while the uh, uh, the Brits might have had 10 rounds in their end fields. Again, I can fire faster. And when it comes to that reload, again, this thing tops the whole, the whole bunch in my opinion. Now, the question is, how does this thing stack up to what is available today? Because I, I know for a fact that there are some, some guys kicking around that still use this as their primary go-to war gun. Um, and a lot of those guys would have been issued these in Korea. Um, 
because unfortunately a lot of the World War II guys aren't hanging around anymore, unfortunately, just due to how long it's been. Um, it, it's by, it's definitely not the worst choice. Um, I, it's far, far better than a sharp pointy stick, but um, compared to a lot of contemporary options, there's there are some things to be desired today. When I talk about contemporary, I mean today, not contemporary with when this was designed. Um, however, I think anyone watching this video is, is gonna know. Anyone who has the know-how to get on YouTube and find this video is gonna be well aware of that. However, there are things that you can do to still make this thing a little bit more realistic to use in the field. So for example, as you might've seen in some of the footage already, I have this Strike Hard Gear um, clip bandolier. This thing has six pouches. I've never actually counted how many pouches there were. Six pouches um, that will hold either one eight round end block clip. I've also used this for some of my other bolt action service rifles because it'll hold usually at least two five round clips in each of the pouches as well. This at least gives you a way of carrying ammo in a simple, easy way. The cartridge belt, which I've never used, um, that you can actually put M1 clips in as well. I've heard positive things about, but again, I don't have any direct experience with those. But there are ways of carrying ammo where this thing is really going to lack is a excessive recoil for the amount of energy you can put down range when especially considering you're limited to World War II spec 30-06, which is effectively identical to 308. Um, if I can get the same amount of firepower out of a 308 battle rifle with larger capacity magazines and the ability to mount optics to make shooting a lot easier, not to mention adding things like flashlights and lasers for night vision, this thing is just kind of left in the pack. I know there are some ways of modernizing these. I just can't help but feel they're a little sacrilegious, but um, Again, as far as a, a modern warfighting implement, what I feel horribly, horribly undergunned if you handed me this and said the British are coming, um, you know, it, again, it's not the worst thing you could hand me, but it, it, I would much rather have something in an intermediate cartridge or again, a more modern 308 battle rifle that's gonna give me some better ergonomics, better optics mounting, etc., etc. Now, one thing you'll probably notice from the footage uh, of me shooting this thing, that I was experiencing some premature ejaculation of the end block clips with possibly the last one or two rounds still left to feed. Um, based on some of the research I did, um, it's a bad clip latch spring. Um, I have already replaced that. I haven't actually had a chance to take this thing to the range again to see if that has solved that issue, but I'm caught, I'm fairly optimistic because when I pulled the old spring out, it, it was, it had lost a lot of its uh, resistance. So I have a feeling that that'll make a big difference. And that also makes me want to get to the point of if you are planning on using this uh, against my, you know, my judgment or some of the others out there as a actual fighting rifle, I would highly, highly encourage you to do some of that preventative maintenance. And, you know, these things are 70, 80 years old at this point. They need a little bit of TLC and replacing some of those springs, getting some of those parts back into original factory condition would go a long way in making sure that these rifles are able to serve you well. Because the last thing you want is one of those old parts breaking and rendering this thing totally useless except for as, once again, a long, sharp, pointy stick. Which, again, if, if we're talking long, sharp, pointy sticks, I would rather have something like this than something a little bit shorter. So, uh, if any of you guys have experience with the M1 Garand, Garand, or US Service Rifle, or it was US Rifle Caliber 30 M1, uh, definitely let me know down in the comment section below. I'd be interested to hear your perspectives on it. If you think I've got some stuff wrong, definitely correct me down in the comment section below. If you have experience running these in competition or anything like that, or any of the strike hard gear accessories, let me know uh, for what it's worth. Ya boy paid full retail price for that. I just think it's a really cool addition and goes well with a lot of my mil serps. 
But anyway, uh, if you have any general questions, comments, or concerns, throw that in the comment section down below. I do want to say thanks to my patrons um, because 30 out 6 ammo is not cheap, uh, not super plentiful, especially right now. Um, so because of their support, I was able to not only procure 30 out 6, but reload for 30 out 6. So I could actually put quite a few rounds through this guy. This thing has been in testing for a couple years now, and it's just been an uh, absolute treat and delight. And if you've never had a chance to shoot an M1 Garand, you owe it to yourself, especially if you're an American. Get out there, put some rounds through one, appreciate our history, and just realize um, how much of an advantage our grandfathers, great-grandfathers, etc., etc., had with these beauties. So anyway, with all that being said, as always, I hope you got something out of this video, and I really appreciate you watching. Thoughts? <clears throat> the trigger's very crisp. Uh, it's not as much recoil as I thought it was going to be. It's not as heavy as I thought it was going to be. It's responsive. This one's shooting just a touch low. But uh, overall, I love it. It is what it is. This is yours. Aww. <laughs> <laughs> no, I like it. I like it a lot.